In a world dominated by the fierce and relentless Vikings, where kingdoms trembled and the very essence of civilization was under threat, emerged a beacon of hope. From the rolling hills of Wessex to the bustling markets of London, whispers of a hero began to spread. A man not just of royalty, but of resilience and vision. A man who would defy the odds, confront invaders, and lay the foundations for a nation that would stand the test of time. Journey with us as we unravel the legendary saga of Alfred the Great, the monarch who didn't just wear a crown, but carried the hopes and dreams of an entire people. Alfred the Great, a name that resonates through the annals of history, was the renowned king of the West Saxons from 871 to 886. Later, he expanded his reign to become the king of all Anglo-Saxons, holding that title from 886 until his passing in 899. Born as the youngest child to King Ethelwulf and his first queen, Osber, Alfred faced the tragedy of losing both parents at a tender age. Before he took the mantle of leadership, the kingdom witnessed the reigns of his three brothers, Ethelbald, Ethelbert, and Ethelred. Alfred's reign was marked by significant administrative and military overhauls, which ushered in transformative changes in England. His early years as king were dominated by fierce battles against Viking invasions. However, his prowess was evident in the Battle of Eddington in 878, where he emerged victorious. This triumph led to an accord with the Vikings, effectively partitioning England into the Anglo-Saxon domain and the Viking-controlled Danelaw, which spanned regions like Scandinavian York, the Northeast Midlands, and East Anglia. Notably, Alfred played a pivotal role in converting the Viking chieftain Guthrum to Christianity. His resistance against the Viking conquests solidified his position as England's paramount ruler. After reclaiming London from Viking control, he adopted the title King of the Anglo-Saxons. The intricacies of his life and reign are meticulously chronicled by Asser, a 9th century Welsh scholar and bishop. Beyond his military achievements, Alfred was celebrated for his wisdom and compassion. He was a staunch advocate for education, pioneering the idea of teaching primary subjects in English instead of the traditional Latin. His reign also saw enhancements in the legal framework, military infrastructure, and the overall well-being of his subjects. It wasn't until the 16th century that he was posthumously honored with the title The Great, making him the sole English monarch to bear such a distinction. Alfred the Great, born in the royal estate of Wantage within the region of Berkshire, came into the world in 849, as chronicled by his biographer, Asser. This birthplace, named after the abundant barrack wood where box trees thrived, was historically a contested territory between Wessex and the Midland Kingdom of Mercia. By the time of Alfred's birth, however, Wessex had asserted its dominance over the region. Alfred was the youngest among six siblings. His eldest brother, Ethelstan, had already been entrusted with the subkingdom of Kent a decade before Alfred's birth, but passed away in the early 850s. Following him, Alfred's next three brothers, Ethelbald, Ethelbert, and Ethelred, sequentially ascended the Wessex throne. While the first two were significantly older, Ethelred was closer in age to Alfred. Their sister, Ethelswith, entered into matrimony with Burgred, the king of Mercia. It's widely believed that all these siblings shared the same mother, Osber, a woman of noble lineage and devout faith, descended from the rulers of the Isle of Wight. However, by 856, she had passed away, leading to Ethelwulf's marriage to Judith, the daughter of Charles the Bald, the king of West Francia. In 868, Alfred's life took another significant turn when he wed Eelswith, a daughter of the Mercian noble Ethelred Musil and his wife Edbur, who boasted royal Mercian blood. This union bore several children, Ethelflaed, who later became the wife of Ethelred, lord of the Mercians, Edward the Elder, who succeeded Alfred as king, Ethelgefu, the abbess of Shaftesbury, Elfthrith, who married Baldwin, count of Flanders, and Ethelweird. In the early 9th century, the West Saxon throne was anything but stable. For two centuries, three dynasties had vied for its control, and no son had succeeded his father as king. Egbert, Alfred's grandfather, ascended to the throne of Wessex in 802. Although no direct ancestor of his had ruled Wessex since the days of Selin in the late 6th century, Egbert was believed to be a direct male descendant of Serdic, the dynasty's founder. 
This lineage made him an Etheling, a prince with a legitimate claim to the throne. However, after Egbert's reign, merely being a descendant of Serdic wasn't enough to be considered for kingship. When Egbert passed away in 839, his son Ethelwolf took over, setting a precedent where all future West Saxon kings were not only descendants of Egbert and Ethelwolf, but also sons of reigning kings. By the 9th century's onset, the Anglo-Saxons had almost complete dominion over England. Mercia was the dominant power in the south until 825 when Egbert defeated it at the Battle of Elendun. This victory transformed former adversaries into allies, crucial for resisting Viking incursions. In 853, when Mercian King Burgred needed assistance against a Welsh uprising, Ethelwolf provided West Saxon aid, further solidifying their alliance through the marriage of Ethelswith, Ethelwolf's daughter, to Burgred. Egbert's ambitions didn't stop at Mercia. In 825, he dispatched Ethelwolf to annex the Mercian subkingdom of Kent. By 830, regions like Essex, Surrey, and Sussex had acknowledged Egbert's authority, with Ethelwolf appointed as the ruler of these southeastern territories. However, the Vikings began their raids, targeting places like the Isle of Sheppey in 835. Although Egbert faced a setback against them in Somerset the following year, he triumphed over a Cornish and Viking coalition in 838 at Hingston Down, reducing Cornwall to a vassal state. When Ethelwolf became king, he designated his eldest son, Ethelstan, as Kent's sub-king. Both Egbert and Ethelwolf maintained overarching control over their territories, ensuring sub-kings couldn't mint their own currency. The 840s witnessed intensified Viking raids. Ethelwolf faced a defeat at Carhampton in 843. However, in 850, Ethelstan achieved a naval victory against the Danes near Sandwich, marking England's first documented naval battle. The following year, Ethelwolf and his second son, Ethelbald, crushed the Vikings at Aclea, inflicting unprecedented casualties. After Ethelwolf's death in 858, Ethelbald and Ethelbert, his sons, took over Wessex and Kent, respectively. But with Ethelbald's death two years later, Ethelbert unified both kingdoms for the first time. In his younger years, Alfred displayed a keenness for knowledge. Asser recounts a tale where Alfred, as a child, was awarded a beautifully adorned book of English poetry by his mother. She had offered it as a prize to whichever of her sons could commit it to memory first. Intriguingly, Alfred would have had to hear the book read aloud to him, as he only learned to read when he was twelve, and his mother had passed away when he was around six. In 853, a notable event in Alfred's life took place. The Anglo-Saxon Chronicle mentions that he journeyed to Rome and was confirmed by Pope Leo IV, who anointed him as king. This event was later misinterpreted by Victorian writers, who saw it as a preemptive coronation, hinting at his future ascension to the Wessex throne. However, this interpretation seems implausible, given that Alfred had three elder brothers alive at the time, making his succession unpredictable. A letter from Leo IV indicates that Alfred was designated a consul. It's possible that a misreading of this title led to the later confusion. Adding to his experiences, Alfred also spent time at the court of Charles the Bald, the Frankish king, during a pilgrimage to Rome with his father around 854 to 855. Upon their return in 856, they found the kingdom in turmoil. Ethelwolf, Alfred's father, was dethroned by his own son, Ethelbald. To avoid an impending civil war, the kingdom's magnates convened and reached a compromise, Ethelbald would govern the western shires, while Ethelwolf would rule the east. After Ethelwolf's death in 858, the throne of Wessex was sequentially occupied by three of Alfred's brothers, Ethelbald, Ethelbert, and Ethelred. During the reigns of his elder brothers, Ethelbald and Ethelbert, Alfred remains absent from historical records. However, the landscape of Anglo-Saxon England was dramatically shifting. In 865, the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle recounts the arrival of the Great Heathen Army, a formidable force of Danes, in East Anglia. Their ambition was clear, to conquer the four distinct kingdoms that made up Anglo-Saxon England. Alfred's emergence into the public eye began in 865, when he was just 16 years old, coinciding with the rise of his third brother, Ethelred, to the throne at the age of 18. 
It was during this time that Bishop Asser bestowed upon Alfred a distinctive title, Secondarius. This title might have been akin to the role of a Tanist in Celtic traditions, essentially a designated successor who was closely affiliated with the reigning king. Such an arrangement, whether put in place by Alfred's father or the Witton, would have been a strategic move to prevent potential succession disputes if Ethelred were to perish in combat. This practice of crowning a successor, both as a royal heir and a military leader, wasn't unique to the Anglo-Saxons. It was a tradition observed by other Germanic groups, including the Franks and Swedes, who shared close ties with the Anglo-Saxons. In 868, historical records capture Alfred fighting alongside his brother Ethelred in a valiant but ultimately unsuccessful effort to repel the great heathen army, commanded by the formidable Ivar the Boneless, from invading the neighboring kingdom of Mercia. However, the real test for the Anglo-Saxons came in 870 when the Danes advanced into Alfred's homeland. The ensuing year was marked by a series of intense confrontations. While the outcomes of these battles varied, and the specifics of two encounters remain elusive, several key engagements stand out. The end of 870 saw a glimmer of hope for the Anglo-Saxons with a victory at the Battle of Englefield in Berkshire on December 31st. But this triumph was short-lived. Just a few days later, on January 5th, 871, they faced a crushing defeat at the hands of Ivor's brother, Halfdan Ragnarsson, during the siege and subsequent Battle of Reading. Yet, the Anglo-Saxons displayed resilience. On January 8th, they clinched a significant victory at the Battle of Ashdown, believed to have taken place on the Berkshire Downs, possibly near present-day Compton or Aldworth. However, this momentum didn't last. They suffered defeats at the Battle of Basing on January 22nd and again at the Battle of Merton on March 22nd, with the exact location of the latter still a subject of debate among historians. Amidst this backdrop of relentless warfare, a significant transition occurred. Ethelred, after enduring these tumultuous battles, passed away in April 871. In April 871, with the passing of King Ethelred, Alfred ascended to the Wessex throne, inheriting not only the kingdom but also the immense responsibility of its defense. This transition was smooth, likely due to an earlier agreement between the two brothers. They had decided that the survivor between them would inherit the personal assets left by their father, King Ethelwulf. Ethelred's own sons, Ethelhelm and Ethelwold, being minors, would only inherit what their father had designated for them, plus any additional lands acquired by their uncle. The underlying understanding was that the surviving brother would become king. As Alfred was engrossed in the funeral rites for Ethelred, the Danes seized the opportunity, claiming two victories against the Saxons, one in Alfred's absence and another at Wilton in May. The Wilton defeat extinguished any hopes Alfred might have had of expelling the invaders. Consequently, he sought peace. While the exact terms remain unrecorded, Bishop Asser mentioned that the Danes committed to leaving the kingdom, a promise they upheld. That autumn, the Viking army retreated from Reading, opting for winter quarters in Mercian London. It's speculated, though not explicitly stated in historical records, that Alfred might have paid them off to ensure their departure. Evidence supporting this theory comes from hoards discovered at Croydon, Gravesend, and Waterloo Bridge, which likely represent the price of peace. For the subsequent half-decade, the Danes set their sights on other English territories. In 876, the Danes, under the leadership of Guthrum, Ossidal, and Anwind, launched a surprise attack on Wareham in Dorset. Although Alfred managed to blockade them, a direct assault to reclaim Wareham proved unsuccessful. A subsequent peace agreement, involving hostage exchanges and oaths sworn on a sacred ring, was quickly violated by the Danes. They executed the hostages and stealthily relocated to Exeter in Devon. Alfred responded by trapping the Viking ships in Devon. A storm disrupted the Viking relief fleet, forcing them to surrender and retreat to Mercia. However, the Danes were relentless. In January 878, they ambushed Chippenham, where Alfred had been residing for Christmas. The majority of the inhabitants were massacred, with King Alfred narrowly escaping with a small group. He sought refuge in Athelney, a Somerset marshland fortress. From this stronghold, 
Alfred waged a guerrilla war, rallying local militias from surrounding regions. This period marked one of the darkest times for the Anglo-Saxon kingdoms. With every other kingdom subdued by the Vikings, only Wessex stood defiant. One of the most enduring tales associated with King Alfred is the story of the burnt cakes. As the legend goes, during his time of refuge in the Somerset levels, a peasant woman, unaware of Alfred's royal identity, offered him shelter. She left him in charge of some wheaten cakes she was baking by the fire. Lost in thought about the challenges facing his kingdom, Alfred inadvertently let the cakes burn. When the woman returned and saw the ruined cakes, she scolded him without realizing she was reprimanding the king. While this story is widely known, it's essential to note that there is no contemporary evidence supporting the legend. It might have originated from an early oral tradition, passed down through generations. The first documented account of this incident appears roughly a century after Alfred's death. In May 878, a pivotal moment in Alfred's reign occurred. Emerging from his hideout in the Somerset marshes, he rode to Egbert Stone, located east of Selwood. Here, he was joyously greeted by the people of Somerset, Wiltshire, and parts of Hampshire. This gathering wasn't just a spontaneous assembly, it was a strategic mobilization, indicating that Alfred had not only retained the loyalty of key regional leaders, but also that these leaders had maintained enough local authority to rally their forces. This suggests a well-organized network of scouts and messengers under Alfred's command. The subsequent Battle of Eddington, possibly near Westbury in Wiltshire, saw Alfred secure a resounding victory. Pushing his advantage, he besieged the Danes at Chippenham, effectively starving them into capitulation. One of the surrender's conditions was the conversion of the Danish leader, Guthrum, to Christianity. In a symbolic gesture of unity and peace, Guthrum and 29 of his chiefs were baptized at Alfred's court, with Alfred standing as Guthrum's godfather. While the immediate aftermath of the battle led to what some historians term the Treaty of Wedmore, the formal treaty between Alfred and Guthrum was likely negotiated later, possibly around 879 or 880. This treaty delineated the territories of the two rulers. The boundary was to trace the River Thames, follow the River Lea to its source, extend straight to Bedford, and then trace the River Ouse to Waddling Street. As a result, Alfred inherited the western part of Mercia, while Guthrum's domain, the Danelaw, expanded to include eastern Mercia. The treaty also provisioned Alfred's control over London and its mints, at least temporarily. Interestingly, parts of Essex, which had been under Wessex since 825, seemed to have been ceded to the Danes after the establishment of the Danelaw, though the exact extent remains unclear. Following the Treaty of Alfred and Guthrum, believed to have been finalized around 880 as Guthrum's people settled in East Anglia, Guthrum ceased to be a significant threat to Alfred. The Viking army that had wintered at Fulham between 878 and 879 shifted its focus to the continent, remaining active there from 879 to 892. While large-scale invasions were curtailed, the coast of Wessex still experienced sporadic Viking raids during the 880s. One notable encounter in 882 saw Alfred engage in a naval skirmish against four Danish vessels. The battle resulted in the destruction of two ships, with the remaining two surrendering. This was one of the four maritime confrontations documented in the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle, with Alfred being a key figure in three of them. Such skirmishes with independent Viking groups were not uncommon during this era. In 883, in what might have been a gesture of gratitude for Alfred's commitment to send annual alms to Rome, Pope Marinus granted a tax exemption to the Saxon quarter in the city. The Pope also sent Alfred gifts, including what was believed to be a fragment of the true cross. However, the peace was disrupted in 885 when Kent, an allied kingdom to Wessex, faced a significant Viking raid, possibly the most substantial since the confrontations with Guthrum. Asser's chronicle of this raid pinpoints the Viking invaders at Rochester and Kent, where they constructed a temporary stronghold to lay siege. In retaliation, Alfred led a force against the Vikings. Instead of facing Alfred's army, the Danes retreated to their ships and set sail to another part of Britain, eventually leaving the following summer. Shortly after this incident in Kent, Alfred's fleet ventured to East Anglia. 
While the exact purpose remains debated, Asser suggests it was motivated by the prospect of plunder. Navigating the River Stour, Alfred's fleet encountered 13 to 16 Danish ships, leading to a naval battle. The Anglo-Saxon fleet triumphed and returned laden with spoils, as described by Henry of Huntingdon. However, as they attempted to exit the River Stour, a fresh Danish force ambushed the potentially weakened Anglo-Saxon fleet, securing a victory for the Danes. In 886, marking a significant turn in his reign, Alfred reclaimed the city of London, embarking on a mission to restore and rejuvenate it. Recognizing its strategic importance, he entrusted the city's governance to his son-in-law, Ethelred, the Ealderman of Mercia. Following this achievement, Alfred adopted a new title, presenting himself as the King of the Anglo-Saxons. The refurbishment of London during the late 880s is believed to have involved a redesigned street layout, enhancements to the existing Roman fortifications, and possibly the construction of new defenses on the River Thames South Bank. This period also witnessed a pivotal shift in the political landscape of pre-unified England. Many chroniclers concurred that it was during this time that the Saxon populace across the region acknowledged Alfred's sovereignty. In 888, the religious realm experienced a loss with the passing of Ethelred, the Archbishop of Canterbury. The subsequent year brought another significant death, Guthrum, once Alfred's adversary and later the baptized king of East Anglia under the name Athelstan, passed away and was interred in Hadley, Suffolk. Guthrum's demise created a void in the power dynamics of the region. With the king of East Anglia gone, other ambitious leaders saw opportunities to ascend and fill the void, setting the stage for potential future conflicts. In the late 890s, England faced another wave of Danish invasions. In either 892 or 893, the Danes launched a two-pronged attack, arriving in 330 ships. They split their forces, with the larger group settling at Appledore in Kent and the smaller faction, led by Hastian, at Milton in the same region. Notably, the Danes brought their families, signaling an intent not just to raid, but to settle and colonize. Alfred strategically positioned himself to monitor both Danish contingents. During negotiations with Hastian, the Appledore Danes made a move northwest. They were intercepted and defeated by Alfred's eldest son, Edward, at the Battle of Farnham in Surrey. Retreating, they sought refuge on Thorny Island, where they were besieged, eventually surrendering hostages and vowing to leave Wessex. They then moved to Essex and, after another defeat at Benfleet, merged with Hastian's forces at Shoebury. While these events unfolded, Alfred learned that Danes from Northumbria and East Anglia were laying siege to Exeter and another stronghold in North Devon. Racing west, Alfred lifted the Exeter siege. The outcome of the other siege remains unrecorded. Hastian's forces, perhaps aiming to aid their allies in the west, began a march up the Thames Valley. They were confronted by a substantial English force led by the Ealdermen of Mercia, Wiltshire, and Somerset. Pushed northwest, they were eventually cornered and besieged at Buddington. An escape attempt failed, and the survivors retreated to Shoebury. After gathering reinforcements, they made a swift move across England, settling within Chester's ancient Roman walls. Instead of a direct assault, the English forces devastated the surrounding supplies, starving the Danes. By early 894 or 895, food shortages forced the Danes back to Essex. Later that year, they navigated their ships up the Thames and the Lea, establishing a fortification north of London. Alfred devised a plan to block the river, preventing the Danish ships from leaving. Recognizing their predicament, the Danes moved northwest, wintering near Bridgenorth. By 896 or 897, the Danes abandoned their ambitions. Some settled in Northumbria and East Anglia, while others without ties in England returned to the continent. The Germanic tribes that invaded Britain during the 5th and 6th centuries had a distinct military structure. Their strength lay in the unarmored infantry provided by the tribal levy, known as the FYRD. This FYRD was essentially a local militia in the Anglo-Saxon Shire, where every freeman was obligated to serve. Refusal meant either hefty fines or land confiscation. 
As per King Ione of Wessex's law code from around 694, a landowning nobleman who shirked military duty would be fined 120 shillings and lose his land, while a landless nobleman would pay 60 shillings. A commoner would be fined 30 shillings. However, the military failures of Wessex before Alfred's reign in 878 highlighted a significant flaw in this system. The traditional Anglo-Saxon battle approach was direct and confrontational, forming a shield wall and advancing head-on. In contrast, the Danes were more strategic, opting for easier targets and cautious raids, ensuring a safe retreat if met with strong resistance. They prepared their bases in advance, often fortifying captured estates, making them hard to penetrate. Once fortified, the Danes could easily outlast a siege or launch a counterattack. The Anglo-Saxon system was also ill-equipped to handle sudden Viking raids. While Shire FYRDS dealt with local threats, a national militia could be summoned for larger threats. However, due to communication and supply challenges, this national force often assembled too slowly to counteract swift Viking raids. By the time they were ready, vast regions could already be devastated. Moreover, during the 878 attacks, Many landowners, who were obligated to support the king, chose instead to side with Guthrum, the Viking leader. Alfred, having recognized these vulnerabilities, used the peaceful years post-Eddington to overhaul Wessex's defenses. He might have drawn inspiration from his stay with Charles the Bald in Rome, possibly learning from the Carolingian approach to Viking threats. Alfred saw the need for rapid response and fortified settlements. He introduced a system of taxation and defense, which included a standing army, garrisons across key locations, and a naval fleet to patrol rivers and estuaries. This revamped defense system was more agile and better equipped to handle the Viking tactics, ensuring that when the raids resumed in 892, Wessex was not only ready but also more formidable. The landholding system in Anglo-Saxon England was central to societal order and defense. Landowners had obligations based on their holdings, ensuring the kingdom could respond to threats and maintain crucial infrastructure. One of the primary duties was to provide soldiers for the local militia, with fines imposed on those neglecting this duty. Additionally, landowners were responsible for maintaining the kingdom's network of fortified towns, which were essential for defense against invaders like the Vikings. Infrastructure, particularly bridges vital for trade and communication, also needed upkeep, and this responsibility fell upon the landowners. The hide, representing the amount of land needed to support a family, was the unit used to calculate these obligations. Under Alfred the Great, these systems were refined to maximize the kingdom's defensive capabilities, playing a pivotal role in resisting Viking invasions and setting the stage for England's future unification. Alfred the Great's defense strategy was anchored in the establishment of a network of fortified towns, or buzz, strategically placed throughout his kingdom. These buzz were about 30 kilometers apart, ensuring that any threat could be confronted within a day. The buzz varied in size and design, from revamped Roman towns with stone walls to large earthen fortifications. A document, the Berghal Heidage, detailed the responsibilities of each bay, indicating the number of men required for its defense. For instance, Wallingford had to provide 2,400 men to defend its walls. In total, the system required over 27,000 soldiers, a significant portion of Wessex's free men. Many buzz were strategically located on rivers, with fortified bridges blocking Viking ships and making their navigation perilous. Others were near royal villas, enhancing the king's control. These buzz were interconnected by a road system, the Heerpaths, designed for rapid military movement. This network hindered Viking movements, especially when they were burdened with loot. The Vikings, unprepared for prolonged sieges, could only attempt to starve a bay into submission. However, this tactic gave Alfred time to mobilize his forces. Alfred's system was so effective that when the Vikings returned in 892, they could only penetrate the outer frontiers of Wessex and Mercia. Despite its success, the system was costly, and some nobles resisted the burdens it imposed. Yet, it was a visionary approach, prioritizing the collective security of the kingdom. 
Alfred the Great, the visionary king of Wessex, was deeply concerned about the spiritual and intellectual decline of his kingdom, especially in the aftermath of the Viking invasions. Drawing inspiration from Charlemagne, he embarked on a mission in the 880s to rejuvenate both religious devotion and learning. He perceived the Viking attacks as possibly divine punishment and felt that by reigniting religious fervor, he might appease any divine displeasure. To achieve this spiritual and intellectual renaissance, Alfred took several transformative steps. He actively recruited scholars from various regions, including Mercia, Wales, and even distant parts of Europe, to infuse his court and the church with renewed intellectual vigor. Recognizing the power of education, he established a school at his court, aiming to nurture the minds of his children, the offspring of nobles, and other promising youths. This initiative was a significant move towards cultivating an enlightened future leadership. Alfred's commitment to knowledge was further evident in his efforts to promote literacy among those in authority. He undertook the monumental task of translating pivotal Latin works into the vernacular, making them more accessible and emphasizing their importance for broader understanding. Additionally, he sponsored the creation of a detailed chronicle that traced the lineage of the West Saxon kings all the way back to the biblical figure, Adam, thereby intertwining the divine with the royal. The church and monastic institutions, which had been ravaged by the Viking raids, were also at the heart of Alfred's revival efforts. He founded new monasteries, such as those at Athelney and Shaftesbury. However, with waning local interest in monastic life, he had to bring in monks from abroad to sustain these institutions. For Alfred, the realms of the secular and the spiritual were deeply intertwined. He believed that as king, he was responsible for both the material and spiritual well-being of his subjects. This belief was evident in his governance style, where he seamlessly integrated religious leaders into roles of royal officials and judges. Through these efforts, Alfred aimed to fortify his kingdom not just militarily against external threats like the Vikings, but also morally and intellectually from within. King Alfred the Great, who reigned over Wessex, passed away on October 26, 899, aged around 50 or 51. Throughout his life, he battled a debilitating illness, which modern doctors speculate might have been either Crohn's disease or hemorrhoids. His initial resting place was the Old Minster in Winchester, alongside his wife Eelswith and later, his son, Edward the Elder. However, Alfred had envisioned the new minster as a mausoleum for his lineage, and four years post his death, the remains of his family and himself were relocated there. The peace of their resting place was disrupted in 1066 with the rise of William the Conqueror. The Norman conquest led to the demolition of many Anglo-Saxon abbeys, including the new minster. Before its destruction, the monks relocated the remains to Hyde Abbey. Yet, in 1536, during the dissolution of the monasteries, Hyde Abbey too was desecrated. The land was later repurposed for farming, and the graves of Alfred and his family remained undisturbed until 1788 when the site was chosen for a town jail. During the construction, convicts unearthed the coffins, which were subsequently destroyed, and the bones scattered. The prison was eventually demolished between 1846 and 1850. Subsequent excavations in the late 19th and 20th centuries sought to locate Alfred's remains, but results were inconclusive. In 2013, following the identification of King Richard III's remains, the Diocese of Winchester exhumed bones from a grave believed to be Alfred's for analysis. However, radiocarbon dating revealed they were from the 1300s. A pelvis fragment from a 1999 excavation was dated to Alfred's era, suggesting it might belong to either Alfred or his son, Edward, but this remains unconfirmed.